In Canto 29 of Paradiso, we come to the concluding conversation between Beatrice and Dante before Dante moves to the final realm of paradise. In the previous canto, Canto 28, Dante and Beatrice together contemplated the mystery of how we might conceptualize a God who is infinite and uncreated. In that canto, the infinite God is envisioned like a point of light, a point of light that, like God, has no extension in time and space. This is one of the most challenging philosophical concepts in all of the Divine Comedy. At least that's what I was thinking when I sat down to prepare this lecture. In this canto, Canto 29, we will enter more deeply into the exploration of the infinite God by turning next to the question of time. That is, how might we conceptualize time in eternity when eternity is timeless? These questions, the questions of where, i.e. space, and when, time, will lead us to towards the ultimate question of God's relationship to creation. Why are things of space and time created at all? The answer to this question will prepare our way to enter the highest realm of Paradiso, the Empyrean. So let's dig in. After Canto 28's vision of God as a point of light with no dimension, we begin Canto 29 in a perfect moment of light. The sun and moon are perfectly aligned on the horizon. Beatrice, Dante's ever-equipped teacher and guide, pauses to take in the view. She sits in a moment of wonder, contemplating the point of light. Our attention is drawn toward the stillness of this potent pause. When she does finally speak, Beatrice guides our thinking back to the account of creation in Genesis 1. I say, I do not ask you, she begins. What would you like to hear, which I have seen within this terminus of where and when? Little children might often wonder what God was doing before God, God spoke creation into existence. But to think about God, and thus to think about God's creation of time in this way, is to be confused. Beatrice wants to first correct us of this fundamental and common error. For he did not lie a drowse and still, neither before nor after can precede the hovering of God above these waters. End quote. Rather, she teaches us the words uttered that spoke creation into existence were words uttered beyond all time, in his eternity, beyond confining space, according to his will. Quote, into new loves burst the eternal love. In these verses of the Divine Comedy, we come to see the fullness of the questions of questions of where and questions of how creation came to be. The fullness of the answers to these questions is found when we ask the question, why? Why did God create? Our first initial response to this question is that we can say there is no reason. <laughs> There's no reason for creation. Creation is not necessary. It does not complete God. The fuller answer to this question is both mysterious and simple. The answer is love. God created because of love. God created out of the abundance of God's love. God in God's own self is Trinitarian. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit the three in one, mutually indwelling, God in God's own self, sufficiency, gives and receives love. And it is through this dynamic, Trinitarian love, that all of creation, all of time and space come to be. Matter and form, Beatrice teaches us, combined or pure indeed, came into faultless being by his act, as from a three-chord bow, three arrows speed. This Trinitarian vision of creation conceptualizes pure form, pure matter, and matter and form combined, all bearing the stamp of the Trinitarian God. 
And this love that springs forth from God is like a ray of light coming forth from that point of light that hits amber or glass, refracting into a multitude of rays in an instant. With this metaphor, we contemplate one creation, but multiple forms, bearing witness to the unity and harmony of all created things. As Beatrice praises, so did the sire's effect of triple form ray forth in being simultaneously, and not drown out form and exordium. All these were ordered when they came to be, their order and their essence, one creation. So let us pause for a moment and take in the wholeness of creation as if from God's own gaze, even if we do so only metaphorically. It's an audacious invitation. Indeed, how easy it is to become muddled when we try to understand these truths on our own terms. Beatrice tells us this is where so many philosophers and their arrogance and limited knowledge get things wrong. So much philosophical discourse centers around these existential questions of how and how the cosmos came to be. Some of this deliberation, Beatrice notes, is just misguided. But some of it, as she points out in lines 82 through 93, is deadly dangerous in its derailment from truth. There she says, down there they dream who do not sleep, with some believing that they speak the truth, some not. The latter bear more fault and blame. You don't philosophize on a single path. You're so in love with how you look so vain, you're carried wide. Even this love of show we here in heaven can bear with less disdain than when you make the scripture halt behind your reasonings or you twist it to sustain falsehoods. They don't consider how much blood it costs to sow it in the world or how deeply the humble man delights the Lord when he stands by it. So here, Beatrice reminds Dante, the humble man has the greater capacity to understand the fullness of creation's purpose. Because the humble man has the capacity toward wonder and praise. In contrast, pride is the ever-present temptation that marks the, ro the road towards error, both in humankind and even in the angels. Our closing guidance from Beatrice comes in the closing lines of Canto 29. Returning to her account of creation like a ray of light hitting glass, in the final lines of Canto, Canto 29, we are led to marvel at the various splendors and particularities of manifold creation. Here, Beatrice answer, answers one final complex theological quandary of how creation could come from a God who is one from a God who is unchanging. How does such a God reflect his oneness in creation? Here, Beatrice follows the theological tradition of Aquinas, who believed that God could reflect God's oneness most fittingly by means of an extravagant and harmonious multiplicity and diversity. As Beatrice speaks in wonder, each creature within God's creation receives its own unique radiance. Love's sweetness, to a varying degree, bubbles or rests the cooler in their souls. Now you can see the liberality and high magnificence of the eternal power pieced out among so many mirrors made, remaining in himself one as before. <laughs>